Many of you will know Professor Mills, but he's a professor of veterinary behavioral medicine in the School of Life Sciences at the University of Lincoln. He's a Royal College of Veterinary Surgeon, European and ASAB recognized specialist in clinical animal behavior. Now, Daniel's actually been a, a great friend to Dogs for Good over many years, and we've worked together on, on lots of projects. And um, certainly Daniel and I have spent many hours talking about all sorts of interesting areas of this work and um, I'm absolutely delighted that he's agreed to come and speak to us tonight because his talks are always absolutely fascinating. So Daniel. Thank you very much Peter and um, welcome and um, I've got a hard act to follow though. <laughs> I don't know what's coming after me as well. Anyway, um, so I'm the Dower academic, just to, I'm the warm up act maybe for Brian, not that he needs it. Um, so, you know, dogs play enormous roles in our, uh, our lives and they fulfill so many different functions. And, you know, we often talk about sort of integrating dogs into society, but actually when you look at it, ever since we've had human society, we've had dogs alongside us. That's how long it goes, you know. When we settled uh, into communities, then, you know, we had dogs with us. There is no such thing as human society. Human society is naturally multi-species, and dogs have been there a long way. And, and so it's not surprising that they play uh, an, such an important role in our lives now. Um, and it's always been historically important. And, you know, in the days before Twitter, you know, and Snapchat, you would have to pay quite a lot to have a picture taken of yourself. And you'd even have your little dog there and make sure they've got a rough collar as well. They've got them fashionized. Um, and, you know, so clearly, you know, people value the company of dogs uh, in many different ways. And we, one of the things about dogs, as I said, is that adaptability. The wolves from which they came from probably lived on the edge of, um, you know, at the change of the Ice Age. And it was that adaptability that um, was exploited and they domesticated themselves. They saw a new opportunity um, in order to be successful. And that is why, you know, dogs fulfill so many functions like service dogs or just being companions, working, and sometimes even being drawing, which I would not recommend um, uh, that you leave your child like that. But, um, but they are, you know, they're very tolerant. But one of the issues that we have to sometimes face, my, my background is, I was first of all qualified as a vet, and I um, actually um, specialized in behavioral problems. And much of my work has been dealing with problems with dogs. It's only in the last, well, 10 years or so, that I've been doing more and more work on the benefits of dogs. Maybe I'm getting to that age where I think I no longer want to be bitten by a dog. Um, I want to be focusing on the, working with the nice dogs. But one of the issues that we have is when we were around dogs, that there are certain things about dogs that we find intuitively attractive. And dogs are very good at pulling at those heartstrings, as we've just um, heard about. And the danger is then that we do things on an emotional basis rather than step back and think about things from a dog's perspective. Because if we get roped up into something emotionally and we make those uh, emotional judgments, there's a danger that we do it, as I said, from a human perspective. And that's the difference between caring about and caring for dogs. Caring about dogs is thinking about it from a dog's perspective. Uh, caring for dogs is what you do for dogs because you love dogs. And unfortunately, just loving dogs isn't enough. And we do see a lot of problems arising from people who love dogs um, and they want to do what's best. But unfortunately, perhaps, you know, that emotion has uh, clouded their judgment. And what I want to do is perhaps just sort of prick your consciences a little bit over the next 10, 15 minutes and get you to think and reflect. And I hope as a result, have an even better relationship with your dogs. And also that your dog has a better relationship with you, if that's possible. Um, but, you know, dogs like to be around people. That's certainly the case. Within sort of the field of relationships, there are actually sort of eight dimensions of relationships. And a number of years ago, I looked at this and thought, actually, these are sort of eight ways in which relationships break down as well. And this doesn't just go for dogs. So even if you're not interested in dogs, you might get some marital guidance tonight. <laughs> um, so, so it's sort of 
think about these eight dimensions of the relationship and think about it from the point of view of, yeah, these, this is what I do. How does my dog know that that's what I want? Do I just expect him to be able to read my mind? Dogs are very good, actually, at reading human body language. We think a lot about their sense of smell, but actually we know that dogs spend a lot of time watching people, and that makes them quite different to wolves, actually. That's one of the big differences. Genetically, virtually identical, but there's been a small number of changes, and one of which is dogs focus on people and wolves don't. And that gives them a completely different worldview. And they're constantly looking, actually, to try and predict what that human's going to do next. And they actually want an easy life, if you think about it. Life's a lot easier. If you can predict what somebody wants, and you do it, and you get fed at the end of the day, that's not a bad way of earning a living. We need to make it simple for them. So first of all, if you think about your relationship, what do you do together? You know, in your interactions, what do they actually involve? And is this the right dog for you for that? You know, um, maybe you need more than one dog, the sort of things you want to do together. Yeah. If you want to go for long walks, then, you know, have you got the right dog for that? But at the same time, one of my friends told me the story of somebody who said they wanted a Bernese mountain dog because they liked hill walking. They did it at least once a month. What's the dog supposed to do the rest of the time? You know, because they were working long hours. That's why they like the hill walking, because they're often working 12 to 14 hours. Well, let's think about, you know, uh, that. So the range of things you do together as well, because we do lots of things with dogs. And as I said, this isn't just about owners. This could be working with dogs, assistance dogs, and things about that. What are the range of tasks? How well set up is the dog to be able to cope with a diversity of interactions and things that you want from it? Um, how often do you do things as well? Again, you know, is this the, how do you set the dog up to, be co to cope with how often you're doing things? As I said, it could be that it's very frequent, or it could be the other extreme, that it's not uh, very frequent. Um, and, you know, you need to think about these things and think about, well, if I'm going to do things at certain times, then, you know, the dog doesn't actually know that it's the weekend. If you get up early each morning, you know, um, and then, you know, what's going to happen at the weekend? Or if you have a great weekend with your dog and then you go to work on the Monday. Think about it from the dog's point of view. How's the dog going to feel? Have you prepared him for the fact that some days you have to go to work and some days you don't? Those sorts of things. The way you do things from one time. So the consistency. If you do, for example, obedience work, it might be that you want, you know, your dog has to do the perfect sit at certain times. How does the dog know the difference between when, I've, when I'm on show versus when I'm at home and I can just slouch anyway? Yeah. Um, do we actually communicate to the dog clearly that, you know, this is the time when I really want you to do it this way? Or do I just get exasperated when, as John said, that John Infidel said, his dog just runs off and does what it likes? Yeah. Um, I have offered him a free consultation next time he's up at Lincoln. Um, he's actually the president of Lincoln City uh, Football Club, he said as well. So you will be out. Um, so the degree to which action is similar or compatible. Do your dog and you actually enjoy the same things? Have you ever thought what your dog actually enjoys? Now, most dogs do work really hard to please their owners, actually, because they know it's in their best interest, amongst other things. Um, have you ever stopped and thought, you know, what does he actually enjoy doing? And how often do I let him make the decisions or her make the decisions and say, you know, let's go for that. Let's, let's try something different. Let the dog um, take the lead. And, you know, you can change roles in, in your relationship. If I, you know, we all have different roles uh, in our relationships, and it can change from time to time. If I go and buy a new phone, in fact, the last time I went to buy a new phone, I took my youngest son with me because um, he's very tech-minded. And the guy started chatting to me about this wonderful phone. I said, this is why I have a 13-year-old with me. I'm off. I'll be back in 20 minutes after he's decided whether you're what you're talking about and whether or not this is the right phone for me. That's his role, you know, to understand that tech. My job is to try and switch the thing on correctly um, and to make it work. So, you know, the same goes with dogs, you know. What do we want? Is this really what they enjoy? And don't be afraid to let the dog occasionally make some of the decisions. The style of what we do, the quality, um, the quality of the time as well. Um, how in tune is the dog with me? Now, this is, this is quite important because, as I say, dogs do like to watch people, but do you make yourself interesting to the dog? Um, John has a problem with dogs and, uh, when it's got rabbits. As he turns blue, you know, screaming for his dog to come back, then the dog thinks, I've not seen you like that before. 
I'll come back, you know? Um, well, actually, you know, you can make yourself interesting in lots of different ways. Um, and it's something actually that we see, which, you know, with the very positive move of using more and more reward-based learning. But the problem is, if you come predictably with rewards, it's a little bit like that relationship that I, I sort of sometimes talk about with people. If you've ever been in a relationship with someone who is really nice initially, and then after a while you get bored with them because they're just rather predictable. And actually, you know, it might be that they bring you flowers on a Friday night, and it's Friday night, so you expect there to be flowers. God forbid that you forget to take the flowers on the Friday night. Um, but it's become very predictable. And the same actually goes with reward-based training, actually. Initially, it's exciting. If you just do the same thing again and again, you might think you're using rewards. Actually, the emotion is gone. And that's not actually necessarily an enjoyable thing for the dogs in that situation. Then we start to move to some of the other aspects of the relationship, the way you interpret things. And this is something I come up a lot in the clinic, um, when people, the, what they think the reason is for the dog doing things. Um, dogs bless them, have simple minds. Um, the sort of things they worry about is, oh, a bit of food's fallen out of my bowl. They don't worry about what's happening next week. Um, they don't have the stresses and strains. They're not scheming to think, what's the best way I can annoy you while you're out, yeah? <laughs> that's, that's not in their makeup, and that's one of the beauties of them in that situation. So, you know, we need to step back and think, and if, the more we understand dogs' minds, actually, as I said, they work in a very simple way, and that, that is actually something that is uh, very beautiful about them, too. Um, but we've got to be careful that we don't impose on them, you know, jealousy and things like that. Um, there's a, a classic experiment that was done on the guilty look of, of dogs, um, where people often talk about, you know, my dog knows he's done wrong. The dog might make an association between having rubbish around the house and you being angry, but he doesn't actually feel guilty about it. That's past. And what they did in this uh, neat experiment is they, they got a group of owners. They didn't tell them exactly what the experiment was about. What they actually told them was, um, we're doing this experiment. We're going to see how good your dog is at resisting treats. So you come into the room and um, I said, right, we need you to leave the room. And then the experimenter will, you will put a treat onto the table and we'll see if your dog can resist it for a certain period of time. In every single case, what they did is they took the treat away. So in no cases did the dog get the treat or get any chance to it. Half the owners, they said, your dog was brilliant. You know, he resisted it. The other half, they said, got a bit of a problem there with your dog. You know, he took the treat straight away. The dogs just didn't get a treat in any case. As soon as the owners came in, those who had been told that their dog had failed the test, they had to take less than two steps, and the dogs were like this, because the dog read their body language, that the owner was angry. They're not guilty. They're responding. They're trying to say, whoa, calm down. And dogs have this actual real ability to communicate, which sometimes gets misread, of trying to calm things down. The classic example, again, the dog that um, with the... That, um, with the poor recall, you know, eventually he comes back and he, because most of your body language is saying, you better stay away from me. Um, the words are saying, come here, you, you, um, at this moment. So he stops about eight foot away, just out of range of you. And that's actually sort of the dog's personal space. And he can sense that, you know, this is a high charge situation. How do I calm it down? Well, I can just go nice and slow. Or, actually, one of the uh, strategies you can use to change the emotion of a situation is let's, let's make it a happy situation. I know, let's play. I'll rush off just as you run towards me in an angry way. <laughs> That's a dog trying to say, let's play, yeah? It's not him trying to undermine your confidence as, you know, a, a leading dog trainer um, and show you off. So. But and several the, the other speakers have already mentioned this thing about the emotional support provided um, to each. And we've done a, a fair bit of work actually about self-disclosure in dogs, uh, towards dogs. And uh, we looked at both sort of men and women um, and uh, their relationships. And it, I hate stereotypes, but it was one of those bits of work which really did fall into 
um, the men are from Mars and women are from Venus category, I'm afraid, uh, in so much as, you know, the sort of things that women tended to talk to their dogs about were things that they wouldn't, when we compared it to their partner, by the way, and they didn't, they would chat to their dogs about things they just wanted to get off their chest. And they knew that if they spoke to their partners about it, and we, we, we actually looked at heterosexual versus homosexual, but I'll focus on the heterosexual data because it was a big, bigger data set. So they didn't want to tell their partners about it because they knew that if they said it, he would try and fix it. And that's the last thing they wanted. They just wanted to get it said. But if they spoke to their partners about it, he would think, ah, oh, I'd better go and find a solution to this. You know, and that's not what they want. So dogs serve that function that, you know, the dog's not going to go and try and resolve anything. It's, he's just there. He's a listener. Um, interestingly, with the males, what we found, first of all, we got very few recruits, and we had to find out why. And then you know, one of the reasons was a lot of folks said, what do you mean, talk to your dog about? Um, um, that's why I didn't do the survey. I don't understand it. Uh, but again, you know, they tended to talk about much more instrumental things. These are my plans, and I'm going to share them with you. Yeah? Um, and here it said. So we talk about dogs in different things the whole time. So how do we help dogs thrive? This, I, I love this movie, and this is sort of how I feel most of my life is, actually. If any of you know this movie, if you think about it, if you go to a place, and I remember the first time I went to Japan, I, I mean, I'm terrible with languages, and, you know, you don't understand a word of the language. You don't understand the rituals, necessarily. Um, I'm, I'm terribly prepared for things as well. It's, it, it, I've got better. I've tried to get better, anyway. You know, how do you make sense of things? Because that's the world that dogs are in with humans most of the time. And what we have to do is try and be consistent. Make sure that those important things in our relationships are predictable, um, because that's what reduces stress and leads to healthy development. But that doesn't mean everything in life should be predictable. You know, playing is fun because it has an element of unpredictable. So consistency is not the same as being um, entirely um, predictable in those situations. But we need to set things up so the dog understands us, so they can predict us about those important things. Um, and this is taken from a little book that we wrote a, a number of years ago, sort of really based on some of the issues that came up with people. And, you know, we should celebrate these differences between dogs and humans. We have different ideas. They've got doggy brains, we've got human brains. There are limits to what we should expect from one another, yeah? We shouldn't expect the dogs to understand everything. And we all make mistakes. It's not the end of the world. We need to forgive and move on uh, from that situation. And we don't speak the same language. Uh, things that we do, you know, we like hugging. We're primates. We go chest on chest. That's what primates do. Actually, dogs don't do that. They sniff each other's bums. We tend not to do that with our dogs. Um, I can see one or two people think, I do that. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm not suggesting that you do that with your dog, but, you know, if we go to hug the dog, for a lot of dogs, that's that takes quite a lot of tolerance to learn to love that, actually. It's not something that ne naturally comes easily to very many dogs. Um, communication is a two-way process. People talk about obedience. I don't like... You make a request when you do a command, and you listen to the answer. You look to see what the dog says. If you ask the dog to sit, does he sit immediately, or does he hesitate? In the behavior work that we do, we see a lot of dogs in chronic pain, actually. They're not being disobedient and spiteful. They're just saying, it hurts to sit. Do, you do I really have to do it at this moment? We need to read, whenever we make a request of a dog, we need to read what the dog says back to us in that situation. Um, and yeah, life is generally better if we both learn to think before we act. That I, I can't say much about that because I'm terrible at that. Um, I'm far too impulsive. And we both function better when we are less stressed. So let's do the things that we enjoy together, yeah? And recognize that when we're stressed, yeah, we're going to occasionally get it wrong. And we're not going to communicate well with our dogs. But remember, there's always lots of ways that we can enjoy ourselves. And a big difference, the thing to appreciate, is the difference between an obedient dog and a well-behaved dog. A well-behaved dog is actually invisible most of the time. He's under the table. He knows what he's expected to do. And actually, as strange as it might seem, being well behaved is cognitively much less demanding than having to respond to commands the whole time. You know, 
I could say that my kids are obedient in so much as they'll put the stuff in the dishwasher if I ask them without picking an argument. They're actually pretty well behaved because they usually do it without me having to ask. And that's the difference. But if we want a well-behaved dog, then the dog's got to be able to predict what it is that we want. So that our part of the deal is we have to be consistent with our dogs as well. So just a few final thoughts. Um, just want you to think about how do you communicate to your dog what you want and enjoy about your relationship? And do you really do it in a way that dogs can easily understand? You know, what do you do with your dog? What are the roles of you and your dog in your relationship? What feelings do you have towards your dog? If you take the first of those, you know, what do you, um, how do you let your dog know that this is what you want? Do you expect him just to read your body behavior? He's pretty good at that, as long as it's consistent, yeah? But just as importantly, what do you do if your dog just, um, doesn't want to do what you want? Do you insist? Because, you know, well, as they say, Fleetwood Mac said, you know, rulers make bad lovers. Well, actually, we should be a bit of give and take in our relationship. And they, they have a right to say, you know what, I don't fancy doing that. That's not that important. Let's do something else. Um, that's fair enough. Think about the roles in the relationship. How do you let the dog know that's what you want? And how do you feel when those expectations are not met? And how do you think your dog feels when his expectations aren't met in the relationship? We do make mistakes um, from time to time. And how do you want your dog to feel about you um, as much as how you feel about the dog? And how do you set things up? How do you expect the dog to show how it feels about you? And what do you do if your dog doesn't seem to reciprocate your feelings? Maybe it's not that the dog doesn't love you, it's just that perhaps you're not thinking about it from the dog's point of view. And if we can just be a little bit more sensitive to these things, then actually we will help dogs thrive in all of our relationships. And I'm going to leave you with my cousin Pete, um, with his dog. Um, and this is actually a quote from my mum. This is how I was brought up. I may not love everything you do, but I'll always love you. And I think that's an important message, not just for kids, but also for our dogs. So thank you very much. And don't forget to thank your dogs for letting you come out tonight. <laughs>